Okay, so today it is my pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague, Tricia Kazar, who is now an associate professor in the uh, Department of Rehabilitation Medicine in the Division of Physical Therapy at Emory University. She directs the motion analysis lab there. And today she's going to talk to us about biomechanics and neural correlates of post-stroke gait retraining. Okay, with that, Tricia, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Lena, for the introduction. And um, I'll start by saying I'm really excited to be here. And um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Before I dive into the science, I'll start out with the most important stuff, which is uh, giving credit where it's due. So I want to thank my collaborators and colleagues at Emory, especially Dr. Boric, Lena Ding, who's right here, our MC, uh, Steve and Gordon, who have, uh, Gordon is an emerging collaborator and Steve's a long-standing collaborator. And of course, trainees and personnel in the lab, especially a shout out to Alejandro Lopez, who's a PhD student, and he's been instrumental in a lot of the neurophysiology data that I'll present. And of course, last but not the least, funding agencies and funding sources. So our lab engages in translational research and the population that we study is people with chronic post-stroke hemiparesis. As you can see with some of the numbers on this slide, this is an important and leading cause of disability. Uh, immense medical cost is incurred because of a stroke. We're doing a much better job with acute management and survival after stroke. However, there are still at discharge from rehab residual deficits and persistent disability with regards to walking and walking function after stroke is uh, the primary focus of our lab and happens to be World Stroke Day is coming up this week. So that's a good coincidence. And with regards to rehabilitation of walking after stroke and recovery of walking function after stroke, there are several gaps in the literature. There has been a lot of research, uh, clinical and neuroscience research, and there have been RCTs done comparing interventions. However, the mechanism underlying these interventions and more importantly, why they work if they do elicit a positive response in terms of improvements in walking and for whom these interventions are best suited is largely unknown. So that's the thrust of the questions that we ask in the, in the lab. And this quote here from a recent stroke review textbook does a nice job of also emphasizing the need for, instead of starting out with RCTs or clinical studies, going in with a mechanistic foundation and understanding the neural and the biomechanical correlates, which is essentially the title of the talk today. So I'll talk about some of the examples of uh, neuromechanics mechanisms that we've probed with regards to stroke gait, both understanding and treating gait. So our approach includes evaluating the biomechanical correlates of stroke using kinematics, kinetics, as well as, of course, measures of clinical walking function. We also study the neurobiology using non-invasive stimulation techniques to probe neurophysiology. And we use neuromechanics measures in context of clinically relevant treatments. Uh, for example, electrical stimulation or biofeedback are the two examples I'll use today. So starting out with um, a focus on the biomechanical correlates. Just as an overview, stroke impair impairments in gait after stroke are profound. We see deficits that affect all phases of the gait cycle, all lower limb joints. And it's a complex problem because of the multitude of deficits and because even starting out and e evaluating which of these impairments should we focus on, whether it should be swing phase, stance phase, ankle, hip, compensations, et cetera, is a complex or a, is, is still fairly poorly understood. An objective decision-making criteria for treating and diagnosing stroke gait are heavily required in the literature. One of the biomechanical impairments that we study and is the focus of a lot of the interventions I'll talk about today is decreased paretic propulsion. So this figure here shows ground reaction force data from a force platform embedded within a treadmill. The green is the paretic leg, which shows a de decrease in the forward push-off or propulsive component compared to the non-paretic leg. And there's a spectrum of disability. Different people will show different magnitudes of the deficit, but this is very common and highly prevalent in people with stroke. The reason we see this deficit in propulsion is of course because of decreased force generating ability, weakness and lack of coordination in the plantar flexor muscles, which are the primary muscles that generate propulsion and also inappropriate positioning 
trailing limb angle is a term we use in the biomechanics literature, at stands to swing, to swing transition of the paretic leg. The reason propulsion is important is because a series of cross-sectional studies over the past 10, 12 years have shown that this decreased propulsion is related not just to the stance phase deficit that it is, but also other swing phase deficits such as decreased knee flexion, slowed walking speed, which is an important functional outcome and treatment goal after stroke, as well as asymmetries in gait. Uh, post-stroke. So we focus on this decreased propulsion and try to target it using different kinds of treatments and use them as paradigms in turn to study the neural and the biomechanical um, changes that underlie these interventions. In terms of the neural correlates, we use non-invasive stimulation, like I said before, and this schematic just gives a rough overview, a cartoon version of the corticospinal tract and some of the primary circuitry for lower limb motor control. So we use non-invasive transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS to evaluate corticospinal tract output using MEPs. Ankle muscles are the target muscles because they're the target for propulsion as well as for the interventions in terms of therapeutically, the stimulation or the biofeedback. And most, uh, a lot of research has already shown this and our work just confirms that in people with stroke, the paretic or the lesioned corticospinal tract shows a decrease in MEP amplitude or overall excitability. In addition to TMS, we also use peripheral nerve stimulation or PNS to probe spinal reflex excitability using the Hoffman's reflex or H reflex amplitude. And this gives us an, a readout of the 1A alpha motor neuron segmental reflex circuitry. Again, similar to MEPs, H reflexes in stroke have been studied previously, and there, there is an increase in, in H reflex amplitude or hyperreflexia, and that's one of the sequelae uh, post-stroke. In addition, with TMS and PNS, we also probe paired stimulation approaches at a range of interstimulus intervals to evaluate the descending projections between the cortex and the spinal lower motor neuron or spinal reflex circuitry. And unlike TMS and H reflexes, the effects of stroke on these descending projections, direct, fast conducting, as well as indirect projections is, is largely unknown. So our work is interested in evaluating how stroke affects these different parts or different levels of the neuraxis and how these neurophysiological correlates of these multi -levels, multiple levels of the nervous system respond to treatments. In terms of the gait treatments or approaches that we use to uh, study as intervention paradigms, like I said, I'm gonna give examples of work with FES or electrical stimulation, as well as biofeedback as targets, as treatments that target propulsion. So this just gives you a collage of the number of different kinds of interventions and treatment approaches that are used in the clinic. Uh, we'll use FES, treadmill training and biofeedback as one example. So starting out with the fast FES intervention, just to give you an overview of what the intervention comprises of or what the active ingredients are. This is high intensity, fast speed treadmill walking. So there's bilateral stepping practice at fast speed uh, combined with functional electrical stimulation that's delivered to ankle muscles. And the muscles we stimulate non-invasively, again, during the gait cycle, are dorsiflexors to restore foot drop and plantar flexors to increase paretic propulsion. This has been very fairly well studied when it comes to the biomechanical and the functional effects of a 12-week intervention. But the neural correlates of fast FES are poorly understood, which is probably common for a lot of other gait interventions as well. So this intervention provides targeted practice through stimulation that's delivered just to the paretic limb, to the paretic ankle muscles. And it's been shown to increase in the short term and long term propulsion and propulsion related variables, as well as improve overall gait function. But the missing link or the hypothesis that we'd like to test is if fast FES induces a preferential increase in the corticospinal excitability and normalization of segmental circuitry at the spinal cord in the lesioned corticospinal tract, which in turn is the source for, or the mechanism underlying the biomechanical and functional benefits of fast FES. The control treatment that we use is fast walking, which is dose matched and intensity matched. 
except there's absence of FES. So it's good. It's still an evidence supported intervention. It's high intensity treadmill training, but it's not targeted to the paretic leg or to specific deficits on the affected limb. Um, the recent study that we completed for, for evaluating the neural correlates of past FES was on in individuals with chronic stroke and we used an ABBA crossover design. So we have a pre or a baseline evaluation of neurophysiology, gait biomechanics and walking function. And then the individuals get randomized to either three sessions of fast FES stimulation and three training sessions, three days a week or fast walking, which is the same treatment without FES. They complete a post eval of the same outcome measures after three sessions of training. And then after a three week, at least a three week, much longer in some individuals washout, they cross over to the other kind of training. And then we again collect pre and post data. So this is a repeated measures design, which helps us take, a, take account for or reduce the effects of inter-individual variability on the training induced changes in neurophysiology and biomechanics. From this study, uh, before I dive into the results, actually, this just gives you a schematic of each training session, what it entails. So things to look out for is that they're very well matched in terms of structure, dosage, and components. There are six training bouts. The only difference is and it's the same individual, similar speeds for training. And the only difference is the presence of intermittent FES for the fast FES group. So the results from this crossover study showed we evaluated soleus and TA MEPs for bilaterally. And I'm just showing data for the paretic soleus and TA here just to save time. Um, this shows raw MEPs from an individual's paretic limb. The before versus after FAST FES, we see an increase in MEP amplitude, but with FAST, the same individual does not show an increase in MEP amplitude. So we don't see that increase with fast, fast training. Group data and individual subject data show again, more consistent increases with fast FES post versus pre-training and more variability or a decline with fast. When we look at soleus MEP amplitudes normalized to baseline, so here, this is just showing individual subject data and an increase would show an upslope and a downslope would show a drop in MEP amplitude. So a majority of individuals, because it's a small sample study, we can look at and see show an increase or upregulation. For TA MEP amplitude, again, a majority of individuals show this upregulation. So in summary, when we don't, we also didn't see, and I didn't show that, similar changes in the non paretic leg. So we're able to target the lesioned corticospinal tract and show preferential increases in both the muscles that were targeted through training on the affected leg. This slide gives you other examples of some summary variables derived using TMS. So now it's delta change in MEP amplitude for fast FES versus fast. So a bigger a number above zero would show an advantage or greater benefit of fast FES for the same person. So for seated, uh, TA MEPs collected in seated, intracortical facilitation, as well as soleus MEPs collected in both seated and standing postures, we see this consistent effect of more individuals, a majority of people are showing a benefit of fast FES. So transitioning to changes induced in spinal segmental or uh, H reflex data with the same three session uh, uh, data set. This shows pre and post H2M ratios on the top and H2M slopes at the bottom panel. And you see pretty much lots of variability, but there's no consistent change from pre to post for FAST, which was our control. For FAST FES, there's still considerable variability, but there was a significant increase in H2M ratio and the slope after versus before training. When we look at the delta though, it's not statistically significant. So there's no between intervention significant effect. So we're not confident based on the current data, we're still continuing to probe and analyze this, but we think that a larger sample and more robust, maybe greater dosage study is needed to try to parse out the effects of this intervention on corticospinal versus spinal segmental circuitry and how that influences its, um, its effects on gait. The paired stimulation approach that I talked about, 
I'm not going to show you the FASTA VS effects data because we did not actually see a change in SLF or LLF. But like I said, we, this hasn't been studied in stroke before. So here we're just showing examples of stimulation pulses, PNS alone, which elicits an unconditioned H shown with the bold line and the paired conditioning, which is short interval or short latency facilitation, SLF. And that conditioned H reflects the larger amplitude compared to the unconditioned, that ratio is used as an indirect probe of the strength of descending circuits, um, both direct fast and indirect slower conducting. So this long latency facilitation, long interval facilitation is the measure of those indirect slower pathways. And in people with stroke, we found compared to able-bodied controls, a reduction in both SLF and LLF. And this is work that's part of Alejandro's uh, dissertation, as well as uh, a product of collaboration with Dr. Boric's lab. So a shout out to both of them. Um, so we're still studying this, there still needs to be more work done. But there seems to be an effective stroke on these pathways. And especially the long latency pathway shows some nuanced differences in that it's not completely obliterated, there's a reduction. And there's some evidence for ipsilateral or from the contralesional cortex longer latency effects as well. So this is certainly something we're continuing to look into. Finally, because we're interested in stroke gait, biomechanics and function, we also wanna know if the neurophysiology metrics are related to gait impairments and walking function. And this just shows three examples of scatter plots of those three levels of the neuraxis that I showed data for, that people who have more impairment in neural circuit function, so smaller MEPs or lesser ICF intracortical facilitation or a higher H to M ratio also show more impairment in either their biomechanics or walking function as measured by gait speed. This is a more recent study with Dr. Ting's lab where Jessica Allen, who's now a faculty at uh, West Virginia, looked at EMG, changes in EMG activation at a range of walking speeds. And this was over ground walking after versus before fast FES training. And here we looked at two responders and one non-responder. The reason this is important is because no intervention, like none, is gonna be a one size fits all and effective on all individuals. And it's important to understand what are the factors that correlate with non-response. So in this case, uh, Dr. Allen's study found that individuals who showed a decrease in soleus TA coactivation, so more normal EMG activation during the gait cycle, were also the ones who were responders and showed a greater improvement in walking speed, but non-responders actually showed a slight increase or worsening of coactivation. So again, another direction that needs to be established more uh, concretely with longer term studies and larger sample studies. So to summarize, when we evaluate the neural correlates of fast FES as a probe and build upon the biomechanical or clinical data that we have, it's messy. It's not as straightforward, but there certainly is evidence for, preliminary evidence for, an increase in lesion corticospinal tract output, some modulation of spinal segmental circuitry that needs to be further studied, and also using EMG data as a probe for this, again, neural mechanisms and understanding what are multiple, using all these measures, how does fast FES work? And can we now predict using some baseline neurophysiology or baseline biomechanical data, the long-term response for an individual before they start out with this uh, intervention? Switching to biomechanical correlates, um, I'm gonna talk, this is less detailed, a little bit more brief, but we'll see, hopefully that works out. So the biomechanical correlates that I'll talk about just focus more on interventions biofeedback as one example, and how they influence multiple biomechanical variables in people with stroke. So before I talk about biofeedback, I'll illustrate one example of a study that looks at a much simpler and much more broadly used kind of feedback, and that's verbal feedback or verbal instruction. So in the context of that same intervention, FAST FES, we asked the question, whether or not adding individualized verbal instructions by a neuro rehab clinician augment the motor learning that's observed by one session of fast FES training. So this shows the same schematic fast FES training. The control was now fast FES and we compared it to fast FES with incorporation with addition of verbal instructions in a faded format throughout the training session. And we 
we tried to give some guidelines to the clinician, but it was not prescribed feedback. So we tried to mimic clinical setting feedback while trying to keep it as organized and uh, robust as possible. And in response to a single session of training where we looked at both within session effects, as well as retention 24 hours later, fast FES with verbal feedback, which is FF plus PT, showed a bigger increase in propulsion and propulsion related variables. We also looked at ankle angle at initial contact, which is AAIC here, and that wasn't as responsive. But certainly the push off variables in TLA showed an effect this shows estimation plots for the same data, but now we're looking at within session change scores on the top, retention change scores on the bottom. So a positive value would show an improvement. And we found, even though again, it's a small sample study, moderate to large effect sizes for an advantage towards fast FES with PT feedback incorporated. So this verbal feedback that's heavily used in the clinic, uh, one observational study shows once every 14 seconds does seem to enhance motor learning when added on top of a systematic or a controlled intervention. The second kind of feedback that we've studied in our lab is real-time gait biofeedback, which we can think of as a more high-tech, objective, quantifiable version of that verbal instruction or verbal feedback. And in this case, the goal is to provide the user or the stroke survivor information about biomechanical variables in an overt, timely, and meaningful manner to modify that targeted variable, to induce a change. This gives a video example that I'll just let play in the background. So we have the person walking on the instrumented treadmill. There's a feedback visual display, which is very simple, kind of boring almost. And the beep is the audio component of the feedback. So when they have a successful strip, when they reach target, the feedback gives them an audio cue and they constantly see the visual equivalent of their push off forces on the screen. We looked at the feasibility of this feedback on able-bodied individuals first, and we found that for the targeted variable, which was in able-bodied people, their right leg, they showed an immediate increase in push-off as soon as biofeedback started. And for a short retention, two minutes retention test without biofeedback, they were able to maintain that increase. So it's able to induce a change in the targeted variable without changing the non-targeted variables. This is a unilateral feedback. And that would be promising for people with stroke who have that baseline asymmetry in their gait. So the effects on stroke gait, these data here show peak AGRF in response to biofeedback, pre-training, and then three retention periods after one training session. All these tests were done without feedback. In between, we had three six minute bouts of AGRF feedback training using that audio visual paradigm. The filled symbols are the paretic leg and they show an increase that's maintained at the 30 minute retention. The non paretic leg, which is the open symbols stay flat, they don't change. And that's, a, that's an advantage because that leads to this deficit or interlimb asymmetry reducing after biofeedback training. We also find trailing limb angle shows a similar effect, as well as plantar flexor moment, step length, so some of the other variables that would expect to be related to push off. Biofeedback about limb position versus force generation is uh, the recent study that we did. So instead of using AGRF as a target variable, here we're using TLA or trailing limb angle as the biofeedback target. And again, the, the format of the feedback is very similar but we're trying to compare the effects of, compared to no feedback, AGRF given as a target versus TLA. And for AGRF, they both seem to be equally effective. When we look at TLA, there again as a, is an equal effect of both interventions, but TLA feedback has a slight advantage significantly compared to biofeedback for targeting that TLA variable. TLA feedback is more promising because the wearable sensors and even visual observation of a PT or a clinician can assess trailing limb angle more easily than push off. So it might have more potential for translation. Moving on to the next step in terms of the biofeedback, we have an ongoing project that's trying to gamify the biofeedback interface to make it more engaging, fun, to give this score that gives knowledge of performance or knowledge of results, keeps track of number of successful steps, and hopefully that'll help enhance motivation and further improve the long-term efficacy of biofeedback as a gait training paradigm. 
So to summarize, in terms of the neural correlates that we used FAST-FES as a paradigm for, there's still a lot of work to be done, right? So the ongoing work we're doing is at the beginning stages of looking at a five-year um, five year project to evaluate 18 sessions of FAST-FES and before, during, and after training with FAST as a control, looking at neurophysiology, biomechanics, clinical function, as well as energy cost as multimodal outcomes for these interventions. In the long term, by understanding the neurobiological correlates, we'd like to develop neuromodulation adjuvants to FAST FES that are based on where is the best place or target in the nervous system to further enhance therapeutic effects, as well as baseline predictors of long term response, so we can have a better uh, decision making criteria for whom FAST FES is best for and who might be better off with FAST training. For biomechanical correlates with the biofeedback work, again, there's lots of next steps and some of them Dr. Ting's lab is collaborating with us on. So a lot of this work has focused on push off or TLA, so certain individual variables. And we're interested in having a more holistic or comprehensive analysis of gait and how it evolves or changes, as well as in including progression and speed as variables on top of that biofeedback paradigm. So using these approaches, our long-term goal or long-term vision is to develop individualized, precise uh, approaches that can enhance both gait function, gait speed, endurance, and also gait quality. So we can have this optimization of speed and gait quality in people with stroke and in the, in the process, maximize quality of life of individuals with stroke. Um, I was debating if I should include this, but I had this made a collage of 2020 um, and all the things it's been. But I think the one thing, despite all the pandemic and all the stuff that's going on that worries me at least, and this is just like me saying this because Neuromatch is a scientist and forum of experts, um, I don't know how we can establish the validity of facts and expertise again. And what we can do as citizens and more importantly scientists to sort of get that back as the data is, is, are what matter. But anyway, so that's more of an open question or almost lament. But uh, again, thank you. And I'll field all the questions that you might have. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm clapping for, for the audience. And I'd like to encourage the audience to go ahead and put their questions in, in the Q&A box. Um, I'll start by just looking at these results, Trisha, because I haven't actually seen them in this format. Um, was the TLA feedback, the trailing limb angle feedback, actually better than the ground, the push-off feedback? Yeah. On push-off. So you're telling them one variable and then they actually do the, the desirable one better. And do you have some ideas about why that might be? Yeah. So fully effective. But TLA, in especially people with stroke, was more effective, not in the controls, was more effective at increasing TLA, the targeted variable. Also, the one interesting finding, which again needs to be corroborated with larger sample and more sessions of feedback, was that in response to TLA feedback, there was less unilaterality of the effects. They showed bilateral increases in TLA. With AGRF feedback, there was a unilateral, only the paretic leg increased AGRF. So there were some minor nuances, which might Wait, be what? Yeah. So TLA wait, wait. wasn't as unilateral in its effect. So if you tell them to improve trailing limb angle of one, the predic leg, they yeah. also improve it, increase it on the non predic leg. Yeah. So there was a significant increase in stroke survivors of the non predic TLA. And it could be that it was, it, it was a difference in interlimb asymmetry in TLA versus push off that how they're dependent on each other more so than push off. So there were, those were the two key differences. But when we look at just push off, they were both equally effective. There was no inter feedback differences for people with stroke. That's weird. Do you think, think that means that we have some internal symmetry generator? It could be. It also brings back this notion of, and you've discussed this about dependencies and interdependencies amongst variables. And feedback can be a good probe to evaluate that because we can try to change one thing and see how it cascades into other variables. And if one causes another one effect, 
the opposite might have, you know, the differences between what you're targeting and what the secondary effects are might vary. And that can help us inform more tailored feedback strategies, maybe. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's see. I know many of you have questions out there. So um, put them in the chat. Um, I, I actually want to go back to the findings, the neural correlates. So you said the corticospinal excitability improves after fast FES. Yes. Yeah, from the three session study. So, so why? That why? That with longer training sessions. I mean, it was. Did you expect that? Because if you're really stimulating peripherally, you you might think that you were doing some kind of spinal upregulation, or don't, I guess it should be downregulation. And um, does that mean that? Uh, I mean, I, talk to me about where the locus of that uh, uh, improvement should or is happening. Yeah, so I think the, the in terms of whether we expected it, that was part of the hypothesis that we would expect to see upregulation of corticospinal excitability. And we wanted to see if this upregulation would be unilateral or more preferential to the lesioned hemisphere or the lesioned corticospinal tract, because that's the one that's getting the stim. The other leg isn't getting the stim. And what you asked before about the locus of change or the mechanism Non, non FES, like somatosensory stimulation or other kinds of just sensory level stim, has been shown because of that barrage of sensory input, which in turn causes upregulation of motor output to increase corticospinal excitability. So, mm. tense and somatosensory input is already known to be an upregulator. And in this case, our, our hope or we posit that when you have task specificity, when you add that motor component and the practice of the movement that's occurring concurrently with the stim, that should actually have an even bigger effect on CSD excitability. There are some studies that, sh that speculate that aerobic exercise also induces plasticity. So the control intervention should also cause, may, might also cause a change in corticospinal excitability, but that might be more bilateral. It wouldn't be specific to the paretic leg. Um, so, uh, I see the questions, but I had, had another thought, which was, um, if people are learning early on, right, do you think that you're increasing their voluntary control of that leg? And then after they learn it for a while, like maybe do more sessions and, and maybe that moves downward. Do you think that you would be able to test that with your neural correlates? Yes, I think that would be awesome if we could parse that out, the time course of changes and how they might evolve or shift from spinal to cortical levels, because that's one of the implicit goals of the study, to not just measure before and after 18 sessions of training, but every three sessions or so, and see which one starts to show changes or modulation first, and how um, they stabilize or evolve over the course of training. I hadn't thought about that hypothesis before. Okay, well, Jasmine Mirdamati has a question of, for the neurophys studies, how many patients were MEP positive? And do individuals with or without an MEP show differences in spinal excitability? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Jasmine, because especially for lower limb TMS, MEP negative or eliciting MEPs is even harder than upper limb. So we used um, um, a bat wing coil, like a specialized coil for lower limb, and we, at least for TA, so Leas, it's fewer, but we were able to get MEPs for a majority of the individuals with that specialized coil. So if I had, I think three out of the 14, and the data I showed was for people where we could elicit an MEP at baseline, it might not be 50 microvolts. That's discussion we've had with Dr. Boric back and forth, but we had active condition, resting conditions, standing MEPs, and that increased our chances of eliciting a, a response, even if at seated rest, we couldn't. So we tried to do, a, a range of tasks and record MEPs from those tasks. And we only looked at the changes in people who had MEPs. So that would be an interesting follow-up to look at with the larger sample study to see if presence or absence of MEP, how that changes the, the long-term response, the neurophysiology response. Um, that's an open question, I think. So you're saying that you didn't do the H reflex if people didn't have an MEP because then you couldn't do the conditioning. Well, that's a, that's a good point, Lena, because we were trying to get the best data set we could and make the most of every participant who walked through the door. If we couldn't get MEPs or if they were, they were actually contraindications for MEPs, 
we would still do the spinal excitability component and three sessions of fast FES. So there were differential cohorts, some people that had just age data, some had TMS, age, and paired pulse data. So, so Right, so the question was with, if, if they didn't have an MB, MEP, was their spinal excitability, so their H reflex response different from the group oh, that, I get that got it? it. Well, now I get it, yes. So yeah. the short answer is there was a relationship between not so much MEP plus or minus, but we looked at the relationship between the size of MEP amplitude and the H2M ratio, and it was an inverse relationship. So people who had high corticospinal excitability tended to also show worse or hyperreflexia in spinal circuitry, if I remember correctly. So there was a relationship, but we didn't look at it with respect to positive or negative. Oh, and so does that mean, do you think there's an inhibitory effect of the descending control or, um, or yes, excitatory? This, oh, so this whole notion of the stroke causes disruption of descending projections, which in turn induce, disrupt the inhibitory normal inhibition on spinal segmental reflexes, and that in turn causes hyperreflexia. So some of those relationships did match that overall hypothesis. However, okay. I think there was another question about examining inhibitory pathways in the spinal cord. I think it's still complicated. Like we have these multiple probes, right? We have TMS, intracortical facilitation, H reflex, and we can look at paired pulse, the TMS and spinal pairing. And even with that, there's gonna be questions that remain, right? So reciprocal inhibition, presynaptic inhibition, if we had enough time and resources, and we have a three hour neurophys session before and after, as a as a function of that training. So I think the challenge is fitting in those extra measures and still not having fatigue or the time course of the session influencing them. So ideally, the follow-up of that follow-up study should be even more zoomed in view at intraspinal inhibition, presynaptic or descending inhibition, Renshaw cells. Like there's a whole array of follow-up mm -hmm. probes that we could, maybe this is a good way of starting out with where is the signal, where's the locus of change, like Lena asked, and then we can follow up with now a more fine tooth comb to see um, even mm -hmm. more of the zoomed in view of that change. Great. Um, so I thought your gaming thing was hilarious. Yeah. Um, in, a good way, in a good way or a, or a bad No, it was great. I was wondering why your biofeedback goes horizontally I would just naturally think about it going vertically. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, I think the the first biofeedback, the old one, was motion monitor was the package we used. And that was the default, that we were just happy to be able to do biofeedback in real time. And we didn't try to play around or modulate it. It yeah. doesn't allow much in terms of range. You can do bar plots. But that zigzag tracking is horizontal. And I do agree, especially for people with stroke, even though in our preliminary the biofeedback study, they didn't seem to have a have any trouble with following instructions and matching biofeedback, that could cause a mismatch. Because ideally, you want something that goes forward, backward, in sync with your leg, which is moving in that forward, backward direction. So there could be some follow up interesting questions about what's the best way to provide feedback that's intuitive and matches with the task. And does that in fact affect someone's interpretation and success with biofeedback? Right, and so when you went to this hammer with the exploding balloons, yeah. do you is it a binary thing, or does it give some some feedback onto the as to the amplitude of whatever variable you're tracking? So, so it, the goal, the vision is, and it's still like the the binary part works, but the goal is to have the movement of the hammer, which again, I think it's the backward forward, which matches oh, okay. it's backward forward, the movement of the hammer to give an indication of the excursion that the person's AGRF is going through. So ideally, it needs to be both the amount, how you approached that push off, and then whether or not you achieved successful increase in push off. Okay, fun. Great. Well, with that, we're our time is uh, about up. If there are no more questions, I'm going to thank Trisha again for a really interesting talk and thank the audience for, um, for being here and for their questions as well. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. All right, take care. Bye-bye.